Hello and welcome to Willow Talk. Great to have your company again, Adam Peacock, alongside Brad Haddon. As always, Hads, how are you? I'm excited today. Um, You're excited every episode. Mate, but... I'm really excited today because we've got a special guest. I'm a little mm. bit nervous as well because his time as Australian selector, we, we used to get hold of his card a bit, um, his Cricket Australia card at the, at the bar now and then. So he, he might get me back for that, but uh, it's going to be an exciting show. Yep, the 35th, the 35th men's test captain of Australia. Greg Chappell is with us today. Greg, thank you so much for being a part of Willow Talk. And um, now's your time to retort against him <laughs> putting a hole in your uh, your expenses. No, nice to be here, Adam, and always good to see Brad. Um, no, we, I think we, we didn't punish the card too much. I don't think we uh, went over the top. I never heard any complaints from James Sutherland or anyone else, so... I think we did all right. Mate, well, uh, you know, they talk about being a senior player. I, mm. I think the one thing you need to know is is what people on tour have the Cricket Australia cards. <laughs> then you know you're a senior player because <laughs> you're going down to the bar. Well, the managers use his a lot. The coach, uh, he's too tight. Well, Buffer was too tight. He's never ah. come out. You just got to know when to get the card in the bar. Then you're a senior player. Keepers. <laughs> always thinking, aren't they? They're always thinking. They're, they were always the smart ones in a, in a cricket uh, team and they had debatable. to be pretty, pretty smart. Yeah, well, it is debatable because, I mean, why would you want to do it unless you, you know, <laughs> you at least could bat. I mean, you know, not every keeper has the ability to get some runs. That, that, that's debatable. I like to move the game forward to cover up that you were scared. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get rolling with all our subjects, and I'll get to it in a moment, the rundown, but what was the first thing you thought of when you saw... Well, this guy, because you Come had, on, a, no. I mean, you, I can name anyone in the last 30 years, 40 years in Australian cricket from what you saw through your own eyes. What about young Bradley over here? Yeah. I mean, he, he stood out in, in a, in a crowd, um, because he could bat as well as keep, mm. keep wickets, strong, um, solid, not in, in the physical sense, but solid in, in emotional and mental sense, you know, everyone's going to make mistakes. The difficulty is dealing with those mistakes and you you're looking for the, the sort of guys that you reckon can handle everything that's going to be thrown at them. The life of a professional sportsman is not that easy. Mm. Um, the easy part is playing the game, but yeah. the stuff that happens to you around that, you know, being in a, in a team sport, at least you've got some teammates around, but you're on your own a lot and you're away from your support mm. system quite a bit. Not everyone can deal with it. And, you know, so you, you need not only those that can play, but those that can deal with the situation and Brad was always someone who you, you had great confidence in could well, handle that. Well, he's after hours activity from what I've heard by doing this podcast with him. He, he, he found some friends, especially <laughs> downstairs in the hotel lobby well, after a, a day's a normal, play. I, I was very, very lucky in my career. So Steve Rickson was, was my coach early at yeah. New South Wales. So I had an ally there at the bar. Then when I went to the Australian team, Rod Marsh spent most of the time <laughs> <laughs> on our Australian A tours, um, our academy um, time. Yeah. Our, our academy time was when I really knew what it meant to be an Australian wicketkeeper. The, the fast bowlers got hammered, the, the batters got hit with bounces um, in the nets or in the drills, and, and the keepers just had a really, really good time with Rodney. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Shock horror. <laughs> you, you had some good, uh, good, good coaches and some good mentors then in, in yeah. the early days. And uh, look, I think Without being ridiculous, you know, I mean, you certainly never overdid it, yeah. but to be able to relax and get away from cricket yeah. from time to time is really important. Mm. The guys that lock themselves in their room and think only cricket, 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 they, they're going to run into problems. Fair enough. <laughs> Dave Warner, <laughs> yeah. where he's at with his career and obviously gearing up for a one last test summer, but I mean, all of a sudden he's just lit it up over there in South Africa. You surprised? I'm not surprised. What I'm surprised about is that he got away from doing what he does so well. Mm. And what he's doing at the moment, he's looking to play shots and looking to move the game forward. That's Davey Warner. I, I saw in England, and even before that, he was trying not to get out. And when you try not to get out, even if you succeed, you don't score mm. any runs because you don't pick off the less than bad balls. Yep. When he's looking to score runs... His feet are moving. He gets into good position to score runs, but he also gets into good positions to defend or let the ball go. Mm. And what he wasn't doing before was getting into good positions. So it was difficult for him to defend and he wasn't knowing which ones to let go because he didn't really know where his stumps are. So if this is the new mindset, I, you know, he can, uh, he can be successful mm. for quite a bit longer. Yes. Staying on David Warner, you, you were very strong when he first came in. A, a mm -hmm. lot of people pigeonholed him. Oh no, he's a, he's a white ball cricketer. And you were one that said, no, 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 this bloke can play all three mm. forms of, of the game. What, what did you see in David that others maybe didn't? 
Well, that, the, the fact that his feet were moving, he yeah. picked up length really yeah. well. He hit gaps. You know, he, he, he didn't hit the ball continually to fielders. You know, you'd see a lot of kids who look good, but they just hit ball after ball to fielders. Davey just hit gaps. Yeah. And he could hit boundaries and he could clear boundaries. He had shots all around the wicket. He was hard to bowl to. Mm. And he's quite intimidating. I remember talking to um, uh, Verinda Saywag years ago about, uh, Verinda was never totally comfortable with fast bowlers. And, uh, you know, we were having the conversation and I said to him, you're not really comfortable. We were playing in South Africa and Donald was, was bowling oh, and, and was a damn good bowler. And, yeah. and not many people felt comfortable with Donald. And I said, you don't feel very comfortable with him, do you? And I, he said, and he always spoke in the third, uh, third person. He said, Sobag never doesn't like fast bowlers, but fast <laughs> bowlers don't like Sobag. And he was right. I mean, yeah. he intimidated them because they knew if they missed their mark yeah. and they didn't have m missed by much, he'd punish them. And same with Davey, you yeah. know, they could bowl a good ball. They could bowl their best ball and see it disappear back over their head. Yeah. Um, and that puts the bowler on notice. And I think that's where Davey got, got away from it. But, you know, as a kid, Davey didn't open. I mean, I no. saw him in youth cricket yeah. batting at six. You know, he yeah. was an all-rounder, bowled yeah. leg spinners and, and batted. And often the team was in trouble. Davey would come in and get yeah. runs and get them out of trouble and get a wicket when they, they yeah. needed a wicket as well. Again, you could just see he he understood the game. Yeah. He had the ability to move the game forward. And, you know, you've got a bat in your hand for one reason and one mm. reason alone. Score runs. Yep. And that's what Davey did. The one thing, and I played a, a lot mm. of my uh, junior, oh, um, great cricket with Davey. Yeah. The, the one thing I liked about him, one, he was a rascal. But mm. to me, rascals win your comps. And, and what you said to say, they'll walk into the fire. Mm. Like you'll be fire for 50 and everyone go, oh, how are we going to get out of this? And Davey will go, well, I'll get us out of it. Mm. And you go bang, 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 and you'll change momentum in the game. That's the big thing I seen with Davey. It was the biggest rascal you played with. Oh, this is, we've only got an hour. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were a few. We we had a side of you know with a few rascals, and and Hads is right. You know, you want rascals, yeah. but you, you and they don't want to be bad people. No, and David no. was never a bad person. No. He was a nuisance at times, and he was like a <laughs> bloody mosquito or a moth. Really, if there was a light on, Davey had to go and see what was going on. Oh. And if you were his roommate, he was a pest, but <laughs> never in a, in a bad way. And that, that's what you want. I mean, you know, we had, um, you know, Doug Walters, um, you know, Doug was a nuisance. He was always laying little traps and playing little tricks and <laughs> things like that. But at the time when things got tight, you needed someone who was going to lighten the, the atmosphere a little bit and just remind you that it's just a game Yeah, yeah. at the end of the end of the day. And I think. You know, as I say, Brad's right, that you need a few rascals and you don't want the goody two shoes. You can have a few of them, but you can't have a team full of them. Mm. You can't have a team full of rascals either. So you need players who can play. But if a few of them have got a little bit of the sense of the ridiculous or they, you know, just want to push the boundaries a bit, mm. they're the sort of players you want around because they're the ones that have confidence in themselves. And they can see how they can make a difference. Yeah. They can see how they can make runs or take wickets, no matter how tough it is. And that's what you want. Or go out at 2am and find a bourbon and coke out of nowhere, like David did on a few tours that you went. <laughs> Someone's <laughs> got to look after the young kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we had three stints at Australian Selection. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed it? Yeah. Look, you know, again, there, there yeah. are always challenges and, and always mistakes and and not every decision you make pleases everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, there are going to be times when um, players are upset that either they're not selected or yeah. then whatever, whatever. Um, I think all you can do is try and do the best job you can do. Um, you know, try and put the best team on the field. And, you know, um, sometimes players have got to understand their time's up. Yep. But the interesting thing I've seen, I've seen selection in my time change a lot. We had... Obviously, GC, you had Rodney, uh, you had Trevor Hones, and, and a lot of the selectors stayed away. That they stayed away from the team. They come and make, make yes, this is a, uh, eleven. Apart from when you needed his credit card, yeah, but yeah. that's different. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you're talking about cricket time, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that relaxing time. Yeah. GC said at the start, we all need that, otherwise <laughs> our heads go. I, I see a lot with selections now that mm. I don't know. It's a modern way, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they're they're involved in warm up. They're in the change room all the time. You see them sitting next to players during the game. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that model works. I'm, I'm not a fan yeah. because I've, I've seen it blow up. Um, yeah. you, you, 
I, I, look, I was lucky. I worked under, you know, three different uh, chairmen of selectors, you yeah. know, Laurie Saul uh, at first yeah. from Western Australia. And Laurie was very detached from the team, but having been an educator and, you know, in the education department, he understood young men yeah. and, you know, he could read from a distance, you know, yeah. what their personalities were like. He didn't need to be in the, yeah. the dressing room. Trevor Holmes, you mentioned, I think, you know, Trevor was fantastic. Yeah, I job. really think he did a great job as uh, on two occasions yeah. as chairman and Andrew Hilditch. And I think Andrew yeah. was, was very good. Um, probably didn't get the credit that, uh, that he deserved really. Um, because he, you know, he didn't like talking to the, the media and, yeah. and nobody really no. does, you know, it's not the part of the job that you do it for. Yeah. They have to front up and you've got 24 million selectors in Australia. Well, you that, have to front up and explain yourself. That, that's yeah. the problem. And sometimes explaining yourself can only get you into, into trouble yeah. you know, because it doesn't make sense to someone who's on the outside. So the ones that, you know, when I, where I've seen it go wrong is when, you know, the chairman of selectors or a selector gets inside the bubble yep. and only hears the talk inside the bubble. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the things I've always said, you know, cause I was a selector for a, at least one season when I was captain yeah, and it wasn't right okay. because you're, you know, up until that point, they always came to you and got your yeah. input you and then went away and, yeah. and picked the team. And yeah. that was the way it should have been yeah. because you needed to be seen at arm's length. And I won't mention names, but I can remember one point where we dropped somebody. I fought really hard to keep him, but I lost the argument yeah. and you walk out and it's, it's a universal decision, unanimous. And you know, you walk out, but a few weeks later, we picked him back in the team and I could see him looking over his shoulder and thinking, when are you going to dud me again? Yeah. And yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, there's no point trying to explain to them that I'd argued his case, <laughs> but I'd, I'd lost the argument. And I, that was no good. And, you know, I explained to the, the cricket board at the time, look, no selector with any common sense is going to continually give the captain players he doesn't want. Yeah. There might be times when you have to say, no, this is yeah. what's best for the team and you, you've got to put up for it, put up, put up with it. But if you're continually sending the captain out there with blokes he's not happy with, it's not going to work. Yeah. So there's got to be that balance. But that's why I always thought you needed an independent selector, at least that was arm's length from, from the team who could say, no, no, I think we've, we've got to go this way. Yeah. Because if you're constantly in the dressing room and, and you're constantly having that conversation with coaches and players, you're not connected to the community. I mean, the, the thing as a selector, I found out what people thought when I went to the golf club. And, you know, I would cop it from, Pump you know, the, yeah. from the, the punters and saying, why are you picking this bloke? Why are the team doing this? Why is that going? For Christ's sake, you know, just, <laughs> let me, let me I'm here to play golf, just yeah. leave me alone. But, but it was good to have that connection to get the feeling of what was going on in the community. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was one of the problems with Sandpaper Gate, the, the yeah. players and, and, the, and the selectors and yeah. the coaches weren't really aware that at the, at that moment they were on the nose with the Australian public. And that's why the board felt they had to go the way they did with Steve and, and with yeah. Davey. And, you know, it's, um, you can lose track of what's going on in the real world if you're in that bubble too long. Did you ever cop the call from the, I don't know if selectors actually make the call and say, this is why, or you just, you cop yeah. a line through your name and you well, go, well, work it out for yourself. Well, well every player has at some time. The great Ricky Ponyan and guys like that, Matthew Hayden, they've all been dropped. Yeah. But I, I tell you, though, sometimes when the selectors tap you tap on the door to have the chat, you go, oh, thank Christ, I've been waiting for this. Yeah. <laughs> like, aren't they? Like, sometimes yeah. you know and you're just trying to hold on. And, and you spoke a bit about it at the start about Davey trying to survive mm. rather than take the game on. Mm. And, and you can feel yourself sometimes in that quicksand. Mm. And once you get dropped, you go, Oh, no, I don't like you. This is bullshit. Then he walks out the door. You go, oh, how good's that? <laughs> <laughs> like, off. Taking a load off. Yeah, yeah, take the load off. Then you go away and you have a look at your um, your form or your technique. Is it a mindset change? Is it? Then you start to develop your game. Then you come back mm. and you think, oh, gosh, I can't believe they didn't drop me months before. Mm. But sometimes as a player, it's a relief when you get dropped. 
Yeah, I've, I'm waiting for my wife to walk in sometimes and go, listen, you've been dropped. <laughs> Work on your game. Come back to me in two months and then you can you re-establish yourself as part of this relationship. Anyway, hasn't happened yet. That, that's a different show. Yeah, yeah that's that is another a different room. show. <laughs> and you've got to lay down and say that It's one. on a different... Bra- <laughs> <laughs> on the couch. Uh, Greg, just some memories, if you could, of, of certain names. It, has, it was a recent edition of Willow Talk that yeah. you came up with something. I quite like it. It's just like pluck some names and then get out. I guess to just first thing into their heads about the yeah, names well, you, that you, you you've mentioned. been involved in some of the most influential players in our game, games that are players that have changed the game, whether it be broadcasting. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to throw a few names at you. And I, and I just, if you've got a little story for us mm-hmm. and it can, this can go anywhere, these stories, they don't have to be cricket. They, you like X rated ones, um, well, but X rated, but like, we'll, we'll see. We'll have the E the next to our thing. It's like Richie Benno. Yeah. Yeah, he was a hero as a as a young bloke, and I mean, the, he had the collar up yep. and had the shirt <laughs> unbuttoned down to the navel. I mean, mm. it was uh, it was almost X rated itself. But Richie had that aura about him, you know, that uh, talk about someone not being, you know, not having a clue, but just pretending. He always looked like he knew what he was doing, <laughs> and pretty much that carried on through his commentary and every uh, every other part of his life. One of the funniest days ever was in the commentary box down at Bell Reeve in the days when it was the old up on the scaffolding yeah, yeah. Uh, down, uh, you know, whatever <laughs> end it is. And uh, it, was a, it was just a domestic one day game and Bill Laurie and Richie are commentating. And we, you know, um, the 12th man was very popular at that mm. stage, the 12th man tapes and so on. So everyone knew what the 12th man had been doing. And, you know, we, we, every now and then we'd break into the 12th man doing certain yeah. things. But the chew for 220 chew never came out when Richie was around, <laughs> except Bill is commentating with Richie and Bill's in the driver's seat. Richie's sort of sitting back, relaxing <laughs> and bugging me, the score gets the two for 222. And Bill gives it the, eh, and it's chew for 220 chew. <laughs> and then he starts laughing, you see. And Richie's just sitting back in his seat, leaning back. And you, we had those, yeah, the ri- lip ribbon microphones yeah. that, if when you weren't talking, you went to put them down. So the other guy knew that he could speak. So you didn't want people speaking over themselves. So Bill never, ever put the, the microphone down. So you had to sit there and watch and wait till he stopped <laughs> yeah. talking and then jump in. Anyway, so he's given it the chew for 222. And <laughs> he's bloody laughing to himself. So we're standing in the back of the commentary box thinking, oh, yeah. this, this, this might get ugly. <laughs> and Richie's there just looking down his lip at him. Sort of, okay, smart ass, you've got yourself into this, get yourself out of it. <laughs> Bill couldn't commentate for two overs and Richie wouldn't. So there was silence for two <laughs> overs. And, it was, and no one was going to say a word, just to, this is, you know, just going to have to play out. But every time Bill picked up the microphone to speak, he'd start laughing. So he'd have to, he'd have to stop. And Richie just kept looking down his lip at him and just, well, you got yourself into it, get yourself out of it. <laughs> and that, that was quite uh, one of the funniest days in the commentary box. Did he, did he eventually say something? Uh, Richie? He was playing along with the joke or is he just literally no, no, not well, impressed? It was just, yeah, Ri- Richie was of that thing that, you know, you got yourself into this. Yeah. You, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not necessarily complaining or criticizing. Yeah. But you started this, you find a way to get through it. Well, but mate, not long after, there's that famous clip of Tony Gregg and they took the obligatory, you know, the, the, the TV coverage in the 80s and 90s. They'd find a beautiful woman in the crowd and take a shot and Tony Gregg couldn't help himself. He said something about it and then there was a pause. And then Tony Gregg's turned to Bill Laurie to say something and Bill's taken Richie's advice and gone, well, you got yourself into this, pal. You get yourself yeah, out of it. Exactly. So. I'm not helping you. <laughs> Another one, and everyone's wants to know about this man, no matter what era you played in, is the great DK Lilly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first time I, I played against Dennis, I mean, he was quick, but he was wild. You know, he had that, the, the wild running yeah, with yeah. the elbows going across yeah. his body. And <laughs> when it clicked, it was awesome. Yeah. But in between time, you know, he'd probably only click one or two balls and over. And then, you know, he was all over the, the shop. And I went on a tour, a second 11 tour to New Zealand with him after his first season. I'd played a couple yeah. of seasons of first class cricket. And so I, I hadn't seen a lot of him. I'd played against him twice. Um, but I didn't know him much as a, as, as a guy. And we got over to New Zealand and the Australian team was in South Africa on a tour at that stage. And um, so I got to know Dennis quite well over the six weeks we were in, in New Zealand. 
he, he's a little bit younger than me um, and very, he at that stage was very naive and we pulled a few stunts on him and he fell for every one of them, you know. And, you Such know, as? How do you, how do you pull a stunt you on take, You take it to that different spot all the time. See, it's not yeah. me as a wicked keeper. I, I'm not sure we got long enough to tell, tell <laughs> this story, but <clears throat> basically um, we were in, in Christchurch practicing at the start of the, mm. the tour. So we've a couple of days, we'd train in the morning, come back and have lunch at the, at the hotel. And I was sitting on a table of the older players, even though I was one of the younger players, because I'd played against them for a mm. few years and I knew them. Graham, um, um, Watson w was one of them. Dave Renneberg from New South Wales was another and, um, Jeff Davies from New South Wales. I, I knew those guys well. So, and, and Graham Watson worked for the, the Carline Breweries in, in Melbourne. So at lunch, at the first day, he ordered a bottle of wine and when the waiter brings it over, he sniffs it and tastes it. Yeah, that'll be fine. And so we would go around the table and it's my turn, you know, a couple of days later and I buy, buy the, the wine. And so the waiter comes over and I sort of smell the wine and taste it. Yeah, that'll be fine. And sitting right behind me on the next table was Dennis Lilly. And he goes, oh, oh, you'd be a toff, wouldn't you? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, he said, well, what all that stuff with the sniffing and the, I said, look, I'll have you know that I used to be a, a wine taster for McWilliams Wines. Yeah. So pull your head in. So he pulled his head in. So <laughs> anyway, cut a long story short, the next day I'm sitting on, on his table and he said, but don't you work with Coca-Cola? Hmm. And I said, yeah, I do. But you said you were a wine taster. Yeah, I got poached to Coca-Cola. I'm, I'm a Coke taster now. And then you could see him sort of look at me and he was a bit, he was a bit scared to say something by this day. And I said, you don't think they send that, the Coke out without someone tasting it, do you? And he said, gee, that must be a tough job. And I said, yeah, it's not as tough as, you know, the trouble when, when I go away playing cricket for a few days or a few weeks and come back, I'll, I've lost my palate mm. and I passed a bad batch and you know, I got into a bit of strife and they put me on the returns and that's a really bad job, you know, where you've got to taste the, so he's taken all this in, you see, and I, oh, and, no. and then, you know, it led to, I knew what he did. He worked with the Commonwealth Bank as a teller. And I just said to him, well, what do you do? And he said, I work at the Commonwealth Bank as a teller. And mind you, I'm 21 at this stage. And I said, oh, I used to work in the bank. And he said, oh, really? Yeah, I worked at the Commonwealth Bank, but I got into a bit of strife. I, I sort of borrowed some of the money one day, which, um, you know, is a bit frowned upon. But <laughs> luckily, the, uh, my father was the bank manager and he sorted it all out. So I went to the other guy and said, mate, I've got a bloke here who'd believe anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we set up a real sting over about three days and we, we got him. From that day onwards, he never believed anything that anyone ever told him. <laughs> So he went from the most naive to the most cynical bloke over a period of about a week. <laughs> but could bowl a bit. He could, could bowl, bowl a bit. and you just want him on your side. Exactly. A quick one before we go, or not so quick, don't want to pass it by, but uh, last night in Sydney you had another Chapel Foundation mm -hmm. uh, dinner, raised a stack of money, upwards nearly half a million dollars again. Fantastic. Uh, I don't know where you're at with overall what you've raised, but um, raising funds for awareness for youth, homelessness in Australia. Um, mm. How satisfying something like this is, yeah, is it for you? it's been really satisfying. I mean, last night was hugely successful. Again, you know, around the, the half a million It'll take us over 5 million, um, Gee, raised wow. and we support seven charities on the front mm. line. We're not a front line charity. We raise the money and we give it to the people who know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. We're, we're pretty strict about, you know, what they do. We want to know what they're doing with it. We don't just give them the money and say, we'll go and do what you like. Um, so we do talk to, with them about what they're using the money for. And so they have to convince us that, you know, their, their request is, is better than the next Yep. Charity's request. Um, but yeah, when we started, Darshak Mehta is the chairman of the, the foundation and Dar Darshak, I had worked with at the LBW, uh, trust before, before that, the learning, bef uh, learning for a better world, um, which was raising money for, uh, underprivileged kids in, in cricket playing countries. But when Darshak stepped down from LBW trust and, um, you know, he had a, had a bit of a break, he said, oh, we got to do something in the chapel name. And I said, no, we don't. <laughs> and he said, no, you should, you know, we have to. 
And Darshak's not an easy man to say no to. So, you know, over two or three conversations, I gave up and said, okay, well, so you said, well, what, what do you think, you know, should be the, the cause? Mm. And I said, well, it's got to be in Australia. It's got to be for young people. And at that stage, I was working with Cricket Australia in Melbourne and I was living at East Melbourne just with the Fitzroy Gardens as my front yeah. lawn. And I used to go into the gardens and exercise every morning and I'd walk through the gardens to work every day. And I was appalled at how many people slept rough in the, yeah. in, yeah. in those gardens in, in the middle of winter. And I, I saw a kid one day, a young person one day, and the profile, it could have been my youngest son. And I just thought, well, you know, there for the grace of God, it. it could be anyone sleeping in there. And, and I'm glad we chose that cause because it resonates with, with people. And, and in a country as wealthy as ours, the fact that we've got 120,000 people without a roof over their head and about 45,000 of them are under, you know, 30 odd years of age mm. and a growing demographic of females. To think that a young person feels safer on the streets than going home is frightening. Yeah. Nobody really chooses to, to do it. It, it it happens to them. Mm. And, you know, I thought when we started, if we could make the difference, you know, put one life back together, it'd be worthwhile. Mm. Thankfully, you know, we're, we're impacting positively hundreds of people every, every year. And, you know, it's, it's a big task. I, you know, we're a fully volunteer charity. Um, so we don't pay anyone, we don't pay any uh, rent or anything. So pretty much all the money that we raise goes to the, mm. to the cause. And that's probably the proudest thing of the whole, whole lot that, um, everything we raise goes to the, the cause. So, uh, it's always a hell of a thing leading up to the, to the annual dinner, just putting it together and, and, you know, a volunteer group doing it and, and to be so successful. Yep. I mean, last night was just the, the Chapel brothers were the, you know, the, the main show. I thought it'd be like the Marx brothers, but mm. it was probably... <laughs> It was probably more like the Three Stooges, okay. but um, <laughs> yeah. you know, we uh, we had a lot of fun and, and it was very successful. And you agreed with each other at the end? No, 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 no. We, we didn't agree at the start and we don't agree at the end, but we, ha we have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> and how can people support? Um, go on the, the Chapel Foundation website. Um, you know, we'll take money. Any yeah. any money will be uh, well received. We, we did the sleep out a few weeks ago and uh, now the, the dinner is the, the big function of, of the year. But yeah, look, yeah, just go onto the Chapel Foundation website and uh, donate some some money because it is going to a really good cause. Yep. Well, we're going to put the the link in the episode notes of this particular Thank episode you. of Willow Talk, and um, yeah, that wraps up this edition of Willow Talk. Greg Chapel, thanks so much uh, for the chat and covered some ground there, but really appreciate your time. <laughs> Pleasure, Adam. Thank you. Hads, see you next week. Been outstanding. See us.